Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our first of our online COVID-19 services. And the aim is that each week we'll put one of these sermons online and you'll be able to download it and do church together along with the other resources on our website, narrabrianglican.org. Uh, each week I'll do the same thing, or Neil, uh, we'll read the passage, uh, we'll pray, and then we'll do the sermon, finishing with prayer at the end. So turn with me to Habakkuk chapter 1, verses 12 to chapter 2, verse 1. Uh, it's in your service booklets, and you can follow along there or in your Bibles at home. Habakkuk chapter 1, beginning at verse 12. Are you not from eternity, Yahweh my God? My Holy One, you will not die. Lord, you appointed them to execute judgment. My rock, you destined them to punish us. Your eyes are too pure to look on evil, and you cannot tolerate wrongdoing. So why do you tolerate those who are treacherous? Why are you silent while one who is wicked swallows up one who is more righteous than himself? You've made mankind like the fish of the sea, like marine creatures that have no ruler. The Chaldeans pull them all up with a hook, catch them in their dragnet and gather them in their fishing net. That's why they are glad and rejoice. That's why they sacrifice to their dragnet and burn incense to their fishing net. For by these things their portion is rich and their food plentiful. Will they therefore empty their net and continually slaughter nations without mercy? I'll stand at my guard post and station myself on the lookout tower. I'll watch to see what he will say to me and what I should reply about my complaint. This is the word of the Lord. Let me pray. Our dear Father, who is in heaven, but who knows the things that happen on this earth, we pray that today, as we spend time in your word with Habakkuk, as he looks at a scene that distresses him, we pray that you'll reassure us that you hear our complaints and that you respond in a way that changes our lives. Father, please apply your word to our hearts, our lives, our hands in these strange days. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm at point one on the outline. You'll find an outline inside your service sheets. And uh, there won't be time for questions at the end, but I'm at point one on the outline. Habakkuk knows certain truths about God's character and nature. Look at verses 12 to 13a. Are you not from eternity, Yahweh my God? My Holy One, you'll not die. Lord, you appointed them to execute judgment. My rock, you destined them to punish us. Your eyes are too pure to look on evil and you cannot tolerate wrongdoing. God is eternal. He has no beginning or end. He has no creation or death. He's not affected by the decay that we feel and we know. He's not limited by time or geography. God is personal. He has a name by which his people know him, Yahweh or the Lord. And God might be eternal, but he's also personally committed to this world, personally invested in it, personally knowable. God is the Holy One. There is no one and no thing that is like God. Put simply, God's unique in every aspect and part of his character and being. Habakkuk connects this to death and he knows that God will not die. God has no sin in him. He's pure in goodness. The only one who is eternally right and good and pure. God who is the one who is in charge personally of all the events of the days of this world. He places people here and there. He appoints powers to rule and to bring order. God is the one who deals with sin. A sin, as we've learned over the last few months, is the attitude and action that we humans display, always and by nature, the attitude and action that says, I'm God, God's not. It's the complete rejection of God, and God judges sin, even in his own mind. God is constantly faithful. He always does, as he says. He is as unchanging as a rock seems to be, but even more so. God is relentlessly faithful. God cannot stand sin or the sinner in his presence. Habakkuk knows all this about God. He's read it, 
He's seen it. He's experienced it. In fact, these truths that Habakkuk knows about the Lord's character and nature have been displayed in the pages of history that Habakkuk knows so intimately. Because of his nature, the Lord chose to commit to a broken world. He made a commitment to deal with the root cause of this brokenness, this thing called sin. Because of his nature, the Lord has committed to achieving this through the family of Abraham. Now, nothing to recommend Abraham, as we've learned over the last few months. He's a childless, idol-worshipping nomad who at the age of 75 has little prospect of the family that God had promised to give him. There's nothing to recommend Abraham when God calls him. In that sense, the Lord displays his total initiative, his grace, if you like, his giving to humans something that they don't deserve. The Lord made a commitment, a promise to deal with sin through the family of Abraham. Because of his nature, the Lord rescued Abraham's family from slavery in Egypt. He constituted them as his own people. He gave them a job, if you remember from Exodus 19, 1 to 8, uh, the job to represent the Lord to the world so that the world would know God and come back to him. Because of his nature, the Lord gave his people, Abraham's family, the nation of Israel, his law, a, a series of clear commandments which, when obeyed, would enable God's people to show the character of the Lord to the whole world. And on the basis of what he knew of the Lord's nature, Habakkuk had cried out to him. Remember Habakkuk chapter 1, verses 1 to 4? Habakkuk is so distressed by the complete failure of the Lord's people, Abraham's family, to actually represent the Lord to the world. Habakkuk was so distressed because the Lord's people were fundamentally broken. Habakkuk was so distressed because the law had been rendered ineffective by the wickedness of the people of God so they couldn't do their job. Habakkuk was so distressed because he was fearful for the hope of the world. If Abraham's family was broken, then where could the commitment of the Lord be? Where was the answer to sin? Because of his nature, the Lord answered Habakkuk. Remember Habakkuk 1, 5 to 11? The Lord reaffirmed his commitment to dealing with sin, the sin of his very own people in an astounding way. Remember what Neil helped us learn last week? The Lord committed to bringing the Babylonians. He'd raise them up to destroy his own people as a judgment for their sin. As he'd already warned them, he would in Deuteronomy 28. Habakkuk knew these truths. Habakkuk had understood the nature of the Lord. And yet God's astounding judgment of sin through the Babylonians has caused Habakkuk a deep and confronting problem. At point two on the outline, if you've got your Bibles there, look at verse 13b. So why do you tolerate those who are treacherous? Why are you silent while one who is wicked swallows up one who is more righteous than himself? On the one hand, this is God. On the other hand, this is what God is committed to doing. He's tolerating the treacherous. He's silent as those wicked Babylonians eat up men like Habakkuk. How is this possible? How is this reasonable? How is this consistent? How can God be this? And how can the same God do that? All against the commitment that God has already made to deal with the sin of the world. Through Abraham's family, Habakkuk's people, God's mom. Have you ever had such a confusing problem? You know, something to be true about God. And then God does something else and the two seem to contradict and you scratch your head and you, you wonder and you ask how and why. And it's not that Habakkuk doesn't trust the Lord. It's not that Habakkuk has a weak faith. It's not that Habakkuk is turning his back on the Lord. It's this. What Habakkuk knows about the Lord and what Habakkuk sees the Lord doing, well, these have created a tension and a perplexed theology and it pains Habakkuk to see it and to hear it. Does that sound familiar to you? 
the problems intensified for Habakkuk as he looks out at the world at his very own people. I'm at point three on the outline. Look at verses 14 through 17 with me. You have made mankind like the fish of the sea, like marine creatures that have no ruler. The Chaldeans pull them all up with a hook and catch them in their dragnet, gather them in their fishing net. That's why they are glad and rejoice. That's why they sacrifice to their dragnet and burn incense to their fishing net, for by these things their portion is rich, their food plentiful. Will they therefore empty their net and continually slaughter nations without mercy? Sometimes it's hard to know where Habakkuk is standing, literally in history and geography, in relationship to these events in time and space. But it's very easy to picture him in Jerusalem, to see him watching as the Babylonians march in after an extensive siege sometime around 586 BC. Surrounded by the rubble, the smoke, the smell of war and invasion and occupation, feeling the damage and deprivation of a siege that had stretched the capital of Judah, of Jerusalem, uh, to its limits. Habakkuk couldn't avoid the image of humans in front of him as a bunch of marine creatures, fish if you like, in a barrel. And they all bear the image of God. God made them. Moreover, they're Abraham's family, the people of God, the people that God had committed to uh, Habakkuk's own mob, and yet here they are, hemmed in, caught, struggling, flapping, waving, drowning. And the Babylonians move amongst them with the ease, the practiced ease of conquerors, like fishermen who've mastered their craft. The Babylonians rejoice as they drag these humans in their wake, as they gather them, as they grind them. And as they slaughter and as they destroy, the Babylonians sing and delight in their very own power and God's image bearers and Habakkuk's very own people and God's mob are wiped out. In fact, the Babylonians are so perverse in their pride that they worship the very power and instruments that gather humans up like fish. And to Habakkuk's eyes, there seems to be no end in sight. This is one endless slaughter with the glee of the Babylonians over all, and there seems no end. God, what are you doing? Does that sound familiar? Have you ever had that deep and perplexing, uh, maybe anguished conflict in your own heart and soul as you wrestle with what you know of God and his nature and then you see what God is doing in the world and you, you ask God, what are you doing? Well, Habakkuk knows how forward he is being with God. I'm at point four on the outline. Look at chapter two, verse one. I'll stand on my guard post and station myself on the lookout tower. I will watch to see what he will say to me and what I should reply about my complaint. Habakkuk braces himself. He's waiting for an answer. He's already posed one question and the Lord has answered it, and the Lord's answer has created a second, perhaps deeper conundrum for Habakkuk, and he then poses this question of this perplexed theology of God being this and God doing that, and he stands and he waits for the answer. And when you picture it in your minds, it it is a truly remarkable image. Habakkuk braces himself, it would seem, on the walls of Jerusalem on a lookout tower. And as he stands there with the backdrop of the smoke and the haze and the destruction and the devastation and the cries and the lament and the songs of war, he looks and he looks for what the Lord will say. He's certain the Lord will answer. But he's also certain, did you catch this? He's also certain that the word that God speaks will create the need for change in his own life. Did you catch that in his words? There in verse 1, and what I should reply about my complaint. It's a very clear statement by Habakkuk. Habakkuk expects and he knows that God's reply will change him. In that sense, Habakkuk is a model for any of God's people. 
His interaction with God has established the truth that God's people can come to God with questions, ask him their perplexing theological questions. God has already shown that he will answer and Habakkuk makes sure that we realize that the answers of God must change us as we hear them. Well, I'm at point five on the outline. Habakkuk's second question of the Lord lays out some guidelines for dealing with perplexing theology, perhaps a situation that many of us are in at the moment. Those times when we, what we know of the Lord's nature seems to sit roughly, awkwardly in direct opposition to what we see the Lord doing. First, Habakkuk starts with what he knows of the Lord. Did you notice that? Too often across history, people start with what they're experiencing and work back to the knowledge of the Lord. Habakkuk actually sets a better pattern for dealing with his perplexing theology. Start with the knowledge that we have of the Lord's nature and character, his consistent nature and character. And in this, Habakkuk doesn't doubt that revelation of God. Did you notice that? It's actually the baseline for how he raises his questions. We're not facing an invasion by a nation of judgment raised by the Lord to wipe out the sin of his people. We're not in Habakkuk's situation. But Habakkuk does lay out for us as the Lord's people today a strong exhortation. Start with the knowledge we have of the Lord as we do with our theological conundrums. Habakkuk rehearses what he knows of the Lord. Habakkuk reminds himself of what he knows of the Lord. Habakkuk states it very clearly, this is what the Lord is. Can I encourage you to remind yourselves of the nature of the Lord by reading the Lord's word? In fact, that's a question you can ask of any passage in the Bible. What does this tell me about the nature of the Lord? In turn, and secondly, this provides Habakkuk with the right framework for posing his questions, raising his questions before the Lord. A right starting point will lead to rightly raised questions. Now, Habakkuk's confusion is palpable, isn't it? His emotion is tangible, but his question is not disrespectful, nor is it beyond the privilege of asking questions of the one who's committed to dealing with the sin of the world. We can ask such questions. It's appropriate, given the right starting point, given the pre-existing commitment of the Lord to his creation through the people of Abraham. In fact, who else, to whom else, where else could such questions be asked or raised? Where else could we go with those kind of queries? Thirdly, we must wait for an answer. Habakkuk is under the clear understanding that the Lord will answer him. Moreover, he knows that the Lord's answer will lead to some necessary change in himself. You see, God's people cannot take the privilege of questioning the Lord without the responsibility to listen and change when he answers. As we raise our questions of the Lord, as we raise our questions with the Lord, as we bring before him our perplexed theology, be prepared for an answer. More importantly, be prepared for the change that the clear revelation of the Lord must bring if we begin at the right starting point. Let me pray. Dear God, we give you thanks for your word. It will be a delight to meet Habakkuk in heaven. It will be a delight to talk with him, to walk with him, to enjoy his presence. Father, thank you that we can do that now as we read your revelation through him. Father, as we do, thank you for the pattern that he set us of how to deal rightly with you. To start with your character to raise the question in the appropriate context and the appropriate framework and then to prepare for your answer and the change that that will inevitably bring. Father, 
in these strange days. Help us to follow this pattern, beginning most importantly with your nature as we raise our questions. In Jesus' name, Amen.